hello and uh, welcome on behalf of uh, CDS I would like to welcome you all to the course uh, remote sensing and GIS for environmental studies so my name is uh, Dr. Ermia Stefari I'm going to be your guide your instructor your facilitator as we learn explore in in the course so before we dive into the course remote sensing and jazz for environmental studies i have to explain the reason why i prepared this video lecture i've prepared this video lecture particularly to postgraduate uh, students in response to the COVID-19 impact on face-to-face uh, -face learning uh, that's going on at Addis Ababa University. So AAU's response uh, to the COVID-19 outbreak is uh, focused on protecting students and staff members to minimize the potential for the virus to spread. All staff are in fact working from home and we are adhering to the government advice on social distancing and travel uh, restrictions. So we are also working on ways in which we can blend online teaching with face-to-face uh, -face learning by ensuring that the teaching learning activities are compliant with the latest government guidance. So I wish you a very pleasant stay with me as we go on learning about remote sensing and GIS for environmental studies. Now let's continue. We'll start from uh, lecture one that is about basic concepts of remote sensing. We'll start with uh, definition of uh, remote sensing. So, so what is remote sensing actually? So, you know, you will find many definitions of remote sensing in many textbooks. So, but there are key terms that we usually use in defining remote sensing. So, one of the well-known definition that is given by Lelisand and Kiefer is given here remote sensing is an art and or a science of obtaining information about an object or feature without having physical contact with the object or with the area or with a uh, with a thing under investigation so this is a general definition so in this definition there are very important words it's an art as well as it's a science so it incorporates you know the issue of you know art and the issue of science we call it science because remote sensing is based on mathematics based on physics especially based on radiation principles based on electromagnetic principles another keyword in this definition is it's all about obtaining information, obtaining, getting information from a distance without having any physical contact, okay, with the with help of electromagnetic radiation. So the question in here that we ask is how can we obtain information without having any physical contact? The answer is with the help of electromagnetic radiation one can acquire or obtain information from a distance okay so this is a general definition of uh, remote sensing so here is one pictorial you know example of uh, remote sensing this is an example of uh, a, a passive remote sensing it all starts from an energy emanating from the sun this is the, the sun radiates energy 
propagates through the atmosphere, you know, when an electromagnetic radiation passes through the atmosphere, it doesn't simply pass through the atmosphere, but it interacts with atmospheric particles. So as a result of the interaction between electromagnetic radiation and atmospheric particles, there are different mechanisms of interaction. Some of the energy will be absorbed, scattered, and transmitted through the, through the atmosphere. The transmitted energy will be able to reach the surface of the Earth and forms interaction with Earth's object. And another form of interaction will be created in here and in, in C. There are three forms of interaction that is created when the electromagnetic energy interacts with Earth's object. These three types of interactions are ref reflection, transmission, and absorption. Okay, the reflected energy will be uh, reflected and sensed by the satellite sensor. Okay, and there are also other satellites which may send signal to Earth objects. Okay, but in passive remote sensing, we follow this path. So the reflected signal from Earth's object is going to be sensed by the satellite sensor to be recorded, measured. Okay? And this recorded and measured signal will be sent to the ground receiving station for further processing. Okay? Or this may this recorded signal may be sent to another satellite for further processing. Okay, once it reaches the ground receiving stations, it is going to be processed, okay, in the form of tapes, digital medias, for the further production of maps, tables, statistics, and the like. So, having looked at this pictorial representation of remote sensing, one can define remote sensing by saying it is a process of inferring surface parameters. Surface parameters mean the vegetation height, vegetation canopy size, and the like, from measurements of the electromagnetic radiation from the Earth's surface. So why do we study remote sensing? This is a very important question that we need to ask before we dive into the subject remote sensing and uh, GIs for environmental studies. There are a couple of reasons that you can find in textbooks the reason why we learn remote sensing. The first reason is because it gives aerial perspective. Okay? It gives a large coverage data at global scale, at national scale, at local scale such as Wereda scale, zonal scale and regional scale. Data can be obtained through remote sensing. So Remote sensing covers a wide area, so you can collect information at a time for a very wide coverage. The second reason why we learn remote sensing is remote sensing gives you uh, an advantage of documenting change. This change could be historical uh, urban expansion, historical uh, land use, land cover uh, condition of a certain area that could be an agricultural landscape, that could be urban landscape, that could be forced landscape. This is a very good advantage of remote sensing. The best, you know, uh, data sets that we use in remote sensing to document change is uh, Landsat uh, satellite image, which uh, started from the year 1972 up to the, the up to the current land condition could be depicted by uh, the satellite uh, image series the third reason that why we study remote sensing is because we can obtain knowledge beyond our human visual perception through remote sensing you know you know our knowledge 
you know thanks to remote sensing our knowledge is now extend beyond our human visual perception you know most of the time uh, you hear that seeing is believing seeing with human eye is only limited by your your uh, your eyes and the electromagnetic radiation that is applicable for human vision is visual electromagnetic radiation it's called a visual range human eyes usually work or operate within the range of visual or visible range this visible range ranges from 0.4 micrometer wavelengths up to 0.7 micrometer wavelengths okay so our knowledge if we rely on this visible range only our knowledge can only be limited by this range 0.4 up to 0.7 but there are a lot of issues that are going on beyond the human or beyond the visible range of electromagnetic spectrum so how can we understand those issues that can be visible out of the visible range such as infrared such as microwave such as x-ray such as ultrasound such as there are so many wavelengths ranges with which we can explore a lot of issues that are going around us so remote sensing gives you knowledge beyond our human visual perception and this, the fourth issue why remote sensing is important is because remote sensing helps you extract information this kind this information is three-dimensional terrain characteristics can be extracted in a minute as a result of remote sensing the best example for this is srtm digital elevation model is a terrain data so we are now able to compute the slope of the whole world in a minute the digital elevation of the whole world in a minute it is because remote sensing gave us this kind of opportunity another information that is useful to extract from remote sensing is land use land cover you have so many other biophysical parameters that can be extracted such as leaf area index and there are other biophysical as well as uh, any other uh, parameters or information that can be extracted so these are a couple of reasons why we we, we study uh, remote sensing now look at this we are able to obtain knowledge beyond our human visual perception we have said that earlier you know this is a whole range of electromagnetic spectrum which ranges from gamma ray uh, all the way down to radio waves microwaves and the like there is a small portion which ranges from 0.4 up to 0.7 this is in nano but i'm talking in micrometer so this is a very small portion of the whole range of electromagnetic spectrum and this is a portion where human eye you know can operate very small portion you know how can we say seeing is believing you know recognizing this fact there are a lot of wavelengths ranges that cannot be detected by human eyes but we cannot deny their existence even if we are not able to detect them okay in order to detect those activities that are operating out of this range can be detected by devising a special sensor you know look at this for example this is the, the our sun the sun has got its own diameter its own size so this, uh, our sun cannot be visible cannot be detected by human eyes why because the electromagnetic energy of the sun cannot be detected by human eyes it's not within this range in order to 
visualize our sun, we need to be able to develop a special sensor that can operate within this range, which is most of the time thermal range. Okay, now we are able to we are able to measure the diameter of the sun, okay, the size of the sun. We are able to predict the existence of the sun, okay, because of uh, uh, remote sensing. Another, you know, knowledge beyond human visual perception is, you know, we are now able to locate people inside a lorry. We are now able to elicit drugs. We 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 detect we can we can detect drugs inside a big lorry we can also detect explosives okay these are not detected by human eyes unless we devise a special x-ray sensor thanks to remote sensing you know remote sensing gives you knowledge beyond human visual perception these are some of the examples i can give you a lot of examples if you go uh, to clinic you will find ultrasound ultrasound is also uh, a, de a device which helps you have you know a picture of your baby okay without without uh, having or with without your uh, uh, your visual you know uh, perception okay Ultrasound is another example. You have so many examples. Okay. And there is a relationship between remote sensing and other, you know, geosciences to mathematics, to GIS, to cartography, to social science, to physical science, to biological science. Remote sensing has this position. Okay. And limitation of remote sensing. You know, we, we don't want to oversell the advantage of remote sensing. We have to tell you the limitations of remote sensing. You know, one of the limitations of remote sensing is uh, the interpretation of the satellite imagery requires a certain skill. The way you extract information, you know, differs from person to person depending on the skill of the, the the expert okay and another issue is remote sensing needs cross verification with ground truth data okay there is a saying called remote sensing without field verification is not sensing that means remote sensing always requires field ver verification or field data and another issue is data from multiple sources may create confusion okay so you need to be uh, you need to be very much skillful to uh, to extract or to be able to extract information from multiple sources of remote sensing okay objectives because of different reasons objectives can be misclassified or confused and distortion may occur due to relative motion of sensors. These sensors could be mounted on on uh, aircraft, on satellites, or on drones. So the relative motion of the sensor and the source could create some kind of distortion. Okay, where do we put our remote sensing data from or in the continuum of our re research uh, process from statement of the problem data collection conversion of data into information and information presentation this is a whole process of uh, problem solving where do you put your remote sensing process remote sensing can be categorized or can help your problem solving process in collecting data as well as in conversion of data into information okay Okay, now let's uh, come into the very basic uh, uh, principles of remote sensing. So 1.3 is electromagnetic energy and remote sensing. Knowledge of electromagnetic energy is needed in remote sensing for two reasons. The first reason why we 
have to know electromagnetic energy is because this knowledge helps you understand the principle of remote sensor okay for example our eye is an example of a remote sensor okay it operates within within a certain wavelength range which is 0.4 up to 0.7 so we came to know this visible range and the principles of our uh, vision because of because we have understood the basic principles of electromagnetic energy likewise in remote sensing there are many many remote sensors in order to understand how do they operate how do they function we need to be able to know electromagnetic energy the second reason why we have to know we have to have a knowledge on electromagnetic energy is to interpret remote sensing data correctly okay this is another uh, very good reason in order to understand electromagnetic energy we we have two models wave model or wave theory and particle theory or electromagnetic energy can be modeled in two ways by wave or by particle okay what is what does wave theory say wave theory says assuming a sinusoidal wave or a sinusoidal uh, model moving at a fixed wave speed this speed is speed of light it is fixed it is constant it is c wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency okay we you from wave theory we can put this theory in terms of c wavelength i mean uh, c is speed of light wavelengths and frequency okay since this is constant if you extract frequency you can have c c is a speed of light over wavelengths now from this equation you can understand that there is inverse relation between frequency and wavelengths so what does wave theory say it says there is inverse relation between uh, frequency and wavelengths okay waves with higher frequency have shorter wavelengths and lower frequencies have longer wavelengths so this is the general understanding that we get from wave theory okay electromagnetic energy co is composed of electrical energy and magnetic energy okay both electrical and magnetic energy are oriented at 19 degree propagates in a sinusoidal fashion that goes with a speed of light c this is c okay so this is generally what wave theory say and the second issue now let's more let's let's have a detailed explanation about wave wave can be explained wave of wave has its own amplitude its own time its own period okay so the time required to complete one cycle is called uh, frequency okay so how fast is a wave is determined by the frequency okay if you see this the number of frequency is different okay this is slow and this is medium and this is fast okay the amplitude tells you the height of this wave okay the period tells you the frequency so normally one over p is frequency so from particle theory we can understand that the energy of a quantum is considered to be proportional to the frequency the energy of a quantum q is proportional to h Planck's constant times frequency okay this is directly proportional okay we know from our previous wave theory frequency is inversely proportional to wavelengths 
So if you relate energy of a quantum with wavelengths, you will find there is inverse relation with wavelengths. Okay? Take a look at this figure. So this is a short wave. Yeah? Short waves are associated with high frequency. High frequency is associated with high energy. High frequency and energy are related based on particle theory, while frequency and wavelengths are related based on wave theory. Okay? If you go on to long wavelengths range, such as radio waves, TV waves, you will find lower frequency and lower energy. Okay? But at short wavelengths, such as X-ray and gamma ray and cosmic rays, the energy associated with such wavelengths radiations are very much high and they can easily damage our hills because they are stronger. Okay, because of particle theory and wave theory, we have now some clue about the energy and the frequency associated with wavelengths. Okay, now let's have a look at the whole range of electromagnetic spectrum, which ranges from cosmic ray, gamma ray, X ray, ultraviolet, visible, near infrared, middle infrared, thermal infrared, microwave, television, and radios. These are longer wavelengths, these are shorter wavelengths. The energy associated with these ones are high and strong. The energy associated with longer wavelengths are very low energy, low frequency, but the wavelength is longer, okay? We can divide the whole range of electromagnetic spectrum by, have, by saying thermal energy and reflected energy. Reflected energy are most of the time short wave infrared, while the thermal ones are longer wavelengths infrared. Okay, those category under shorter wavelengths are middle infrared, near infrared, visible ranges. So the visible range is it is a range where our eyes can operate. Okay, blue, green, red. There is UV rays and near infrared rays. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we will we will continue our uh, from our previous lesson. Now in our today's uh, session we will be learning at uh, 1.4 uh, lesson that is about energy interaction in the atmosphere so last time you know we have learned about uh, energy principles the basic principles of uh, electromagnetic radiation electromagnetic radiation can be explained by uh, wave theory or particle theory. So what does uh, wave theory say? Wave theory says there is uh, inverse relation between wavelengths and frequency, while the particle theory says there is a direct relation or proportion between um, energy of the quantum and frequency. So using these two theories, we can express the relationship among the energy of the quantum, frequency, and wavelengths. Now we have uh, come to know the basic principles of the electromagnetic energy. Now let's explain and let's discuss about how does the electromagnetic inner radiation interact with atmospheric particles or atmospheric constituents. So when electromagnetic radiation passes through the atmosphere, it doesn't pass simply through the atmosphere, but it forms some kind of interaction. These interactions could be uh, like this, scattering or absorption. So the atmospheric constituents, such as molecules, clouds, water vapors, 
aerosols that are present in the atmosphere could cause some kind of scattering of the electromagnetic radiation or absorption of the electromagnetic radiation. So most aerosols, most clouds usually absorb the incoming electromagnetic radiation in the atmosphere. You know, only some portion of the electromagnetic spectrum will you be able to manage to pass through the atmosphere and reaches the surface of the Earth and forms interaction with Earth's objects. Okay? So in remote sensing, what we are interested in about is those electromagnetic radiations or those wavelengths ranges in which the atmosphere is transmissive are called atmospheric windows. In remote sensing, we are interested in knowing those wavelengths ranges which are able to pass through the atmosphere. So it is very important to know the impact of different atmospheric constituents in the atmosphere on the electromagnetic radiation. For example, in different atmospheric conditions, there are times when molecules are abundantly present in the atmosphere, and there are times when aerosols are abundantly present, and there are times where clouds are abundantly present. So the different seasons, the different time condition of the atmosphere will affect the acquisition of remotely sensed data due to the presence of different atmospheric constituents in the in the atmosphere when there is a clear sky most of the time molecules are present for example in clear skies there are no clouds there are no aerosols but there are molecules when molecules are abundantly present in the atmosphere the kind of interaction that is you know created is usually uh, Uh, Rayleigh scattering, you know, Rayleigh scattering is a type of scattering created as a result of the presence of gas molecules. Gas molecules are very small in diameter, they are very small in size. So when the diameter of the particle is much, much less than the diameter of or the wavelength of the incoming electromagnetic radiation, the type of scattering that is created is called Rayleigh scattering. It is denoted by SR. And when the diameter of the incoming electromagnetic radiation wavelengths is equivalent in size with that of the diameter of the particle in the atmosphere, the scattering is me scattering denoted by SM. And when the diameter of the atmospheric constituent is much, much greater than the wavelengths of the incoming electromagnetic radiation, the type of scattering created is called non-selective scattering. What kind of atmospheric constituents are this with a diameter greater than the incoming electromagnetic radiation? If you ask this question, you will find that most of the time water vapor are atmospheric constituents with much diameter, with greater diameter than atmospheric, I mean, than electromagnetic radiation. So, so at different atmospheric conditions, there are different types of scattering created. So, Rayleigh scattering, me scattering, and non-selective scattering. So these are the different atmospheric constituents responsible for different types of scattering. When smokes and dust aerosols are present, the diameter is equal to the diameter of or the wavelength of the incoming electromagnetic radiation. And when gas molecules are present, most of the time during daytime, when there is clear sky, 
you will encounter Rayleigh scattering. During Rayleigh scattering, there is a blue scattering. If, if it is, you know, during daytime and when during sunrise and sunset time, the color of the sky becomes red or orange. These are the effects of Rayleigh scattering. And if you see non-selective scattering, it is created as a result of the presence of water vapor. When water vapor is too much in the atmosphere, during you know cloudy season, during rainy season, the type of scattering is non-selective. It got you know this name non-selective scattering. It is because water vapor has got a much greater size than the wavelength range, the wavelength diameter the atmosphere non-selectively scatters all of the incoming electromagnetic radiation from the sun, then the type of color that is created in the sky is white. What will happen if the atmosphere non-selectively scatters all of the incoming electromagnetic radiation? The, the color that you see is all of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the sum total of all of the electromagnetic spectrum or all of the wavelengths region is white. White is not the absence of color, but white is the inclusion of all colors. Okay, because the atmosphere non selectively scatters all of the colors, all of the wavelengths regions. The type of color in the sky that you see is white. White is an indication of the, the presence of water vapor in the atmosphere. Now you can indirectly say there is a water vapor. There is too much water vapor in the atmosphere when you see the sky is white. So this is a very important point. So. The, the type of scattering is determined by the type of atmospheric constituent present at a certain time in the atmosphere. So these all conditions will affect the amount of the type of electromagnetic radiation that can reach the surface of the Earth. So in remote sensing, knowing this is very important. Okay. You know, here is a very important topic related to the specific wavelengths region that can reach the surface of the Earth are called atmospheric windows. Okay? In remote sensing, we are interested in atmospheric windows. Okay? What are these atmospheric windows? Atmospheric windows are soft wavelengths regions with wavelengths ranges in which the atmosphere is transmissive are called atmospheric windows. Now look at this figure. This figure shows at the y it is transmission at the x wavelengths region. So it shows you which wavelengths region you know has a low transmission and high transmission. For example if you go to this wavelength region between 100 micrometer wavelengths up to 0.1 centimeter uh, wavelengths, it is blocked by water vapor. So the transmission of the atmosphere in this region of the wavelengths is low, almost zero. The responsible, you know, uh, factor, the responsible or the cause of the atmospheric constituent responsible for the blockage is water vapor while the responsible atmospheric constituent for low transmission of electromagnetic radiation of this region are oxygen in here ozone in here carbon dioxide in here you will find different atmospheric constituents at different wavelengths range being responsible for the cause of scattering or absorption okay for example, for, uh, for
for low transmission of this wavelength range below 0.2 are oxygen and ozone. So when there are there is too much atmospheric constraint, you will have some kind of trouble in your in the availability of electromagnetic uh, radiation for remote sensing. So atmospheric windows are very important for remote sensing. Why? It is a wavelength region in which different remote sensing uh, remote sensing sensors operate. Okay. Without atmospheric windows, there is no remote sensing. For example, remote sensing operates in this wavelength region, in the green wavelength region. For example, we do have blue green red sensors we do have near infrared sensors so there is no remote sensing sensors which can operate in this in the gray or in uh, in the non-green part of the wavelength region so remote sensing only operates in atmospheric windows so it is very important to know which regions are atmospheric window so knowing this also very important in order to design a sensor so if you would like to design a new sensor and if you end up designing a sensor for this region and this is meaningless okay for example our eyes as a sensor can work on this visible range so you can see the atmosphere is transmissive to this wavelength range so we are now able to see this wavelength range there is a sensor which can operate under visible range that is a natural sensor that is our eyes okay there are also sensors which can operate under here under here and the like so now let's uh, take a look at this uh, section 1.5 which is energy interaction with earth's surface now let me remind you that once the energy is emanated from the sun it propagates through the atmosphere forms interaction with atmospheric constituents and reaches the surface of the earth what will happen if an electromagnetic radiation reaches the surface of the earth this is the next question that you can ask. In remote sensing, knowing energy interaction with Earth's object is very important. This is the incident electromagnetic radiation. Once it reaches the surface of the Earth, it creates three types of interaction, absorption, transmission, and reflection. So energy incident is equal to energy absorbed, reflected, and transmitted. If you divide the whole equation or this part of the equation and this part of the equation by energy incident, energy incident, energy incident, energy incident, it becomes what? This is one. This is one. And energy absorbed over energy incident is equal to, it is called what? Absorptance. Okay. Energy reflected over energy incident is called reflectance. Energy transmitted over energy incident is called transmitters. They are denoted by these symbols. Okay, absorptance, reflectance, transmitters becomes one. So energy neither created nor destroyed. Destroyed. So the sum total of the, the sum total of absorbed, transmitted, reflected becomes hundred. The incident energy. Okay. But in remote sensing, it is very important to, to pinpoint two most important points. One, the proportion of energy reflected, hmm, absorbed and transmitted, will tell you the nature of the material type, the nature of the object. Okay, This difference permits us to distinguish different features on an image. Okay? This is one important point. The proportion of energy reflected, absorbed, transmitted, will tell you the material type, which is the nature of the object. So this will allow us 
to distinguish the type of the material on a satellite image okay and the second important point that you should note is that the wavelength dependency the first one is object dependency of that proportion and the second one is wavelength dependency now let's take a look at the same object let's assume the object is forced even if the objective is the same the amount of reflected absorbed and transmitted energy will vary from wavelength region to wavelength region okay this is called wavelength dependency okay different objects will show you or will uh, display different amount of reflectance at different wavelengths region for example if your object is forced the amount of reflected energy in the near infrared portion of the spectrum is very high than the amount of reflected energy in the visible portion of the spectrum okay this is a peculiar characteristics of forced reflectance if you see the reflectance of soil it is different if you see the reflectance of water it is different but let's fix the object now the object is forced even if the object is the same the amount of reflected energy absorbed energy and transmitted energy will vary depending on the wavelength region okay these are the two most important points so try to uh, remember these important points what can you understand from energy interaction with earth object the amount of uh, energy reflected absorbed transmitted will vary depending on the object type and that will tell you the nature of the object the second important point is the wavelength dependency wavelength dependency means what even if the object is the same the amount of reflected absorbed and transmitted energy will vary uh, depending on the wavelength region in which you are referring to for example if your object is forced for example forest by their nature will show you there is high reflected energy in the near infrared portion of the spectrum than in the visible portion of the spectrum okay these are the two most important points we will be using for identification of objects on the satellite imagery okay now let's come to the the, the very uh, most important uh, aspect of this uh, lesson that is remote sensing of vegetation you know based on the energy interaction with earth surface when we say earth surface there are different types of earth surface but in environmental studies we are interested in earth objects such as vegetation soil and water and hence we will be studying the remote sensing of vegetation remote sensing of uh, forced i mean remote sensing of water and remote sensing of soil and different geomorphologies okay so when we say remote sensing of vegetation we mean remote sensing of forest we are remote sensing of agriculture remote sensing of rangeland wetland and urban vegetation okay after you know getting some idea about uh, remote sensing of vegetation we will be uh, we will be understanding the very basic uh, concepts of remote sensing of uh, vegetated landscapes okay so uh, remotely sensitive information of grouse vigor and their dynamics from their sterile vegetation can provide useful insights for application in environmental monitoring okay what is the benefit of knowing remote sensing of vegetation if you know you know the basic concepts of remote sensing vegetation you'll be using that information for environmental monitoring biodiversity conservation agriculture management forestry management urban green infrastructure management and rangeland management these are important applications of remote sensing vegetation and in remote sensing of vegetation it is very important to pay attention and understand the temporal characteristics of vegetation you have to know when to select you know the 
the, the, the timing of uh, the satellite image, you know, matters. For example, if you select a satellite image that was taken during rainy season, for example, we know that rainy season, in rainy season, the atmosphere is, you know, the atmosphere is full of water vapor. We know that water vapor creates absorption of electromagnetic energy. Uh, this again, in turn, creates less amount of electromagnetic energy available for remote sensing. And hence, no data is collected during rainy season. It is very difficult to acquire, you know, a data during rainy season. Okay? But what is the best time for you to use remote sensing to detect vegetation is dry season, okay? So timing is very important when attempting to identify different vegetation type to extract useful vegetation biophysical information from remotely sensed uh, data, okay? And in remote sensing of vegetation, you know, the basic idea is to know the spectral characteristics of healthy vegetation, okay? This is the prominent figure, uh, you know, that you can find it everywhere in uh, remote sensing books, textbooks, okay? Now, have a look at this spectral characteristics or spectral reflectance of vegetation, okay? What is the spectral characteristics or spectral reflectance, or sometimes it's called spectral signature, okay? So, how do you remember the word signature? Signature is this one. Your signature is like this. So, it is very important to, uh, to identify you from, from uh, somebody else. So, government usually take your signature, okay? In order to identify you as as uh, Hermes or as uh, somebody else. So it characterizes you, you know, different from other uh, person. So likewise, a spectral signature is the very important characteristics of uh, vegetation, okay? The word spectral tells you that it is related to wavelength region, okay? The signature is going to be created as a function of wavelength region, okay? What is the characteristics of the reflectance as compared to mm, wavelength region? What is the reflectance amount at different wavelength region? So spectral signature is a curve that shows you wavelength region versus reflectance, okay? The maximum reflectance that you see is not more than 40% or 50%, okay? Why? In earlier, in the previous lesson, we have learned what reflectance is. Reflectance is the amount of reflected energy as compared to the amount of incident energy. Okay, so this is the ratio. It cannot be 100, okay, because there are other factors, absorptance, reflectance, and transmittance. Okay, the sum total of absorptance, reflectance, and transmittance is equal to 1. So, reflectance cannot be 100. If you allocate 100, the absorptance and the transmittance becomes 0. Now we are focusing on reflectance, okay, versus wavelengths region. Okay, the amount of reflected energy in different wavelengths range is different depending on the nature of the object. Now we have a vegetated surface. Okay, even if the object is the same, in our previous slide, we have said that even if the object is the same, the amount of reflected signal in different portion of the spectrum is different. This is a very important characteristic of remote sensing of vegetation. Now let's have a look at the spectral characteristics of healthy green vegetation, okay? The healthy green vegetation shows the reflectance at different wavelengths range, okay? 
the spectral characteristics of a healthy vegetation is controlled by three important factors, leaf pigment, cell structure, and water content, okay? In the visible portion of the spectrum, the spectral characteristics is controlled by leaf pigment. There are absorption bands because of chlorophyll presence. There are also peaks, okay? While in the near infrared portion of the spectrum, the spectral signature is controlled by cell structure, whether the leaf is spongy or whether the leaf is a smoothie, okay? In the short-wave infrared portion of the spectrum, the spectral signature is controlled by water content, whether the leaf has too much water or less water, okay? If the leaf is dried, hmm, the, the, the impact of drought on leaf will be visible in the short-wave infrared portion of the spectrum. If the leaf is dry, you will see a higher reflector signal. If the leaf has too much water content, you will see a lower reflected signal, okay? This is very important in identification of a stressed vegetation versus healthy vegetation. Now, look at this spectral reflectance characteristics of healthy, stressed, and severely stressed vegetation. So, when the leaf is stressed, you will see that the leaf is, you know, the leaf can be uh, easily dried. If the leaf is dry, this portion of the spectrum is controlled by the water content. Okay, in the in the in this portion of the spectrum, the higher reflected, you know, curve shows you that this is severely stressed, and this is moderately stressed, and this one is healthy. If there is no water in the leaf, that means the leaf is stressed. Okay, if the leaf is stressed the reflected signal will be higher in this portion of the spectrum. So you can easily identify the severely stressed, and moderately stressed, and the healthy one, okay? Usually, what causes lower reflected signal in an electromagnetic, I mean, in the spectral signature is the water content. If there is too much water, whether it's bit in soil or bit in leaf, it will cause to have uh, a lower reflected signal. Water is an absorptant, okay? It absorbs electromagnetic energy. If there is high absorption because of water, uh, the reflectance becomes mm, higher, okay? So this is the best example to consider the temporal aspect of reflectance. In January 1, February 1, this is a one month difference cropping pattern, okay? In, if you come in January 1, it is very difficult to identify different crop types, okay? If you come in February 3, it is very difficult to identify corn from soybean and again from rice. But if you wait one month, you can easily identify it. So you have to choose the best time for remote sensing, okay? For identification of different crop types. And when you overlay the spectral signature of water body, vegetation, and soil, they will have distinct spectral reflectance curve. Okay, this is a spectral signature for different objects. This will tell you, uh, this will help you identify different objects on a satellite image. Look at water. Water is high absorber of electromagnetic energy. Okay. So you don't expect much reflectance. This is reflectance, this is not absorption, okay? So since it is high absorption, there is high absorption in water body, the reflected signal becomes very much low. Okay, there are different factors that are responsible for the change of this original reflectance curve, depending on the, the water content, for example. This is the original healthy green vegetation spectral signature. The relative water content of a leaf may affect this signature. If you, for example, a 5% water content of leaf and 100%, this is, as you go down to this, the amount of water content in the leaf increases. Thus, relative water content increase will show you to have a different reflectance curve. If there is 5%, that means less amount of water content in the leaf, 
it will cause the reflectance curve to have a higher reflected signal okay so this is a dried leaf and this is wet leaf okay using remote sensing spect uh, especially the hyperspectral remote sensing data such as Averis data you can identify the different crop types that is irrigated okay in remote sensing you can uh, identify which ones are healthy green vegetation, which ones are dried, which ones are stressed vegetation. Assume this is irrigated area, big irrigated area, using sprinkler irrigation, okay? You can, this circle is now identified in remote sensing. This is barley, this is alfalfa. Knowing this is very important to estimation of yield, to know where is less water productivity so that you can take some kind of measure to improve the water productivity and the like. So these are uh, some of the applications of uh, remote sensing of vegetation. Okay. This is also another uh, satellite image that is called Landsat TM imagery in 1982 in California and in, in, uh, yeah, in US. So they have used this Landsat TM and maps the different crop types okay now in remote sensing of vegetation another important aspect is vegetation index or in plural form vegetation indices vegetation index is a single number that quantifies vegetation biomass okay for each pixel in a remotely sensitive image so if you want to use remote sensing of vegetation you have to be able to estimate uh, vegetation index Okay, there are different vegetation index, simple ratio index, normalized difference vegetation index, and DVI. This is, this is a symbol for reflectance, near infrared reflectance minus uh, red reflectance over near infrared reflectance plus red reflectance. This is called NDVI. This is the most commonly used vegetation index for, I mean, in remote sensing of vegetation. There are different re references. You can read those references. And also, you know, you know, identifying the drawback of NDVI, there are scientists who developed enhanced vegetation index also. You know, in dry area, in arid and semi-arid area, NDVI can be can be used effectively. But in humid and subhumid area, NDVI is very difficult to use. In that case, enhanced vegetation index is much uh, useful. So you can compute this. And by using NDVI or EVI, it is it is very important to uh, to use NDVI as an index of drought. For example, we know, we all know that in 1984 there is a significant drought in East Africa. After the drought, there is a good condition in during during growing growing season. From June to September is a growing season, so you can uh, you can see there is a well distinct condition during drought year and after the drought year. So there is this much, you know, greenness difference between drought year and after. Uh, drought year that is good season this is an example of enhanced vegetation index from modi satellite imagery and ndvi okay the higher the value the, the good condition is so high ndvi value indicates there is a good condition while lower ndvi value shows you a dry condition Okay, NDVI or EVI value ranges from minus one up to positive one. The value that is around zero shows you a water body or bare land or sparse vegetation. Okay, in between it shows you whether it is bushland, grassland, woodland. But highly vegetated areas are shown by EVR or NDVI values with, uh, with values closer to one 
okay now let's come to remote sensing of water body okay in in learning remote sensing of environmental studies we will it, it it is very important to know remote sensing of water as well okay the best wavelengths which which wavelength region is best for discriminating land from pure water is the first question that you ask this will help you you know demarcate the water bodies and make some kind of analysis of temporal changes of water bodies for example if you go to abaya chamo these are water bodies lake tana lake hawasa lake zuai if you want to know the temporal changes of this water body you need to know which wavelength region is best to use okay so most of the time suspended mineral suspended sediment will affect the original reflectance of pure water in that case you will have a different you know application scenario for example uh, let me show you this hmm? uh, this is the original spectral reflectance curve of clean water the the amount of clay soil hmm, if you add this much amount the amount of reflected signal you know the reflected signal will will go up okay this shows you the amount of sediment load the amount of soil that is suspended in the clean water okay so a reflectance of sometimes you have this clean water if you have too much silty soil mm, the reflector signal will go up like this and this also shows you the algae laden water versus clean water algae laden water will have a different ups and downs while clean water will show you a very uh, clear uh, reflectors okay this is the best example of wetland change in a Amo area in 1973 it looks like this in 1986 and in 2000 this is also a recent image taken hmm, from Ethiopian remote sensing satellite one for Lake Tana and from Sentinel two it shows you the extent of uh, the wetland in Fogara area and also it shows you the extent of the the umboch that is algae or the aquatic plant that is uh, very much invasive uh, in uh, in in Lake Tana okay these are some of the applications of uh, remote sensing of uh, water bodies okay we can use remote sensing of water for showing the temporal uh, trajectory of wetlands as well as aquatic plants in order to estimate the invasive species over Lake Tana and, and the like our final topic is uh, remote sensing of soils you know remote sensing can play a very limited role in the identification in the inventory in the mapping of surface soil if it is uh, again not covered with dense vegetation if it is covered with dense vegetation remote sensing plays a very limited uh, role but remote sensing can provide us a very useful information for knowing the chemical composition of rocks okay whether there is too much iron whether uh, there is too much uh, some kind of uh, you know uh, mineral remote sensing can also play a significant role in extracting geologic information such as uh, linaments we can also estimate lithology we can also estimate uh, structure drainage patterns can be estimated from remote sensing okay for example look at this drainage pattern extracted from satellite imagery having this drainage pattern information we can use this for uh, hydrogeology for hydrological analysis for uh, linamint analysis and the like okay 
uh, we can also uh, the reflectance characteristics of soil can be a function of uh, texture, moisture content, organic matter, iron oxide content, surface roughness. So all of these factors need to be uh, considered. Okay, this is the exercise that you need to do and submit. Okay, before uh, our next class. Here are the additional references for uh, your uh, consumption. This is remote sensing of environments. It's a very good book, and this, are, this is journal article. This is also another uh, very good book that you need to uh, find and uh, read. Okay, thank you very much for uh, listening to me attentively.